Hello and welcome to the Flix Forum podcast where each episode we go back and we look at a Netflix original film in the order of release. Today we have Netflix 205th film from 2020, it's the thriller A Fall from Grace, directed by Tyler Perry. It stars Crystal Fox, Felicia Rashad, Brescia Webb, McCard Brooks, Stifley Tyson and Tyler Perry. I'm Jesse and I am here with MJ. How are you? I am very well, Jesse. I'm very well. How are you? Good, 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 good. I uh, I like Tyler Perry, so I'm excited for this chat. <laughs> I have very little relationship with Tyler Perry, so I'm keen to uh, keen to jump on your bandwagon and see what you've got to say. Good. Well, um, yeah, this is uh his first original for Netflix. I think he's done another a few since this, but uh, this is our first one. So let's let's kick off with our fast flicks where we do our quick. Summary of what the film's all about. What's your fast flicks for a fall from grace? All right. We've got a lawyer who's always been too chicken to actually go to trial, who takes on a murder case and tries to convince her client to flip on her guilty plea. I like that. That's uh, that's good context to what this is all about. I, in you saying that, I've sort of gone, oh, yeah, mine doesn't really cover the story too well. But I've, I've gone, uh, <laughs> <laughs> a woman accused of murdering her husband but is there more to the story? <laughs> oh god. Well, no, I, that's fair enough because I was like, do I, do I, do I attack this from like the Grace perspective, or do I attack it from the Jasmine perspective? I kind of feel like, as much as it's Grace's story, it was kind of. I feel like we were following Jasmine more of the time, so I went, I went lawyer angle. Good, I liked it. Um, so this is this is a Netflix original. We like to work out how it's arrived on our streaming platform. So what could you find out about this film and, and how it got to Netflix? Well, the main thing I did find out was is the uh, the idea behind the Tyler Perry Studios, which are uh, kind of fascinating. Like his, his, his company or his production company, he's got its own studio. And I'm actually, I'm unsure because he, he, had, he had a studio already and he redid it, got even an even bigger one. And I think that this might have been the first film that was, that was filmed on his new big one, but then the dates kind of don't match up as whether it was the old one or not. So I think, I think this was the first one in his new big one in Atlanta, uh, which I think is like the biggest, the biggest production studio in, in America or something like that, which is, um, which is awesome. So, and it was filmed over <laughs> five days, which that's incredible. Like really like this is a two hour film with lots and lots of scenes. Actors would have been working their asses off. Um, do you have anything to add on the whole Tyler Perry studio stuff? Yeah, I think it, I think it's interesting because the I think it's it's either on Wikipedia or IMD. One of them says like this was filmed in 2018 or something, which isn't true. Um, complete this this was filmed in December of 2019 and then released like a month later. That so filmed in five days, put together ah. and then released like straight away. Uh, which is which is crazy. And the, the that's and that's crazy. part of part of the reason why I like Tyler Perry so much is because of what he's put into black filmmaking and this idea of this studio in Atlanta that, you know, it's, it's such a, a cool thing for an individual to be able to have this place where he can create his own stories and, you know, they, not just film, but he does a lot of TV. Um, and, you know, like, like you mentioned, he's the first African-American um, to own his own studio outright. Like this is, this is huge. This is, and, you know, the, the, the kind of films that he makes are not necessarily the, best movies but you know in five days it's fairly cheap you get the, the crew Amazing. together yeah. um yeah I, I think that he, he's a, a really important figure in the industry not just because of his ability to be successful but for the ability to get more stories heard um from black voices so you know i think yeah i i, I admire the guy What's what? Where, where's he got all I, I remember him speaking at the oscars a couple of years ago and, and i was quite fascinated by him and his ideas I don't know anything about his history, though. Where's he come from? How has he become who he is? Is it just through the entertainment industry, or is there more to it? Yeah, he started. I think uh, from memory, he started off with a few stage shows that were recorded, and then they were put out for physical release, became popular, and then his big sort of character is Medea, which is more of a a comedy character. Which is, he plays a, a drag character, like a, a female mm-hmm. character, and I think there's more than ten Medea films, um, and I've seen bits and pieces of. of of those throughout the years and you know this is a guy who you know based on 
creating, funding his own films and puts them out. And he was getting, you know, number one box office hits because he was targeting such a specific audience and and being celebrated by that. So I think, you, you know, you look through the, the 2000s and the 2010s and if he's had a film coming out, you could almost lock that in as being the number one film because he'd target specific weeks where there weren't big blockbusters coming out and, and he'd have the number one film. So, you know. Um, it's not rocket science, is it? <laughs> no. Like, clever guy, clever guy. Yeah, good on him. Um, oh, that's cool. That's interesting. I, I appreciate that context. So the film itself, as you said, it was re- it was released on Netflix uh, on the 17th of January 2020, which I think if they filmed that, I think it was pre-Christmas in December. We're, <laughs> we're talking that's come on screen in a month. Over Christmas holidays too, and you're probably having a few functions, having a few drinks throughout that period. So that's it's incredible. Um, Netflix comes out. And has reported that twenty it was watched by twenty six million during its first week. And I'm I'm a, I'm skeptical of the best of times in this stuff, but I am massively skeptical on this one because obviously we know Netflix don't often uh, release this data, but by comparison, so, so I think at the time this came out, this was either the first, the most, or second most watched film in the first week. Twenty six million that they've released. The, the Oscar nominated The Irishman was watched by 17 million in its first week, according to Netflix. So smashed by a fall from grace. And Bird Box, we know Bird Box was just a phenomenon, uh, was watched by 26 million in its first week. So it's the same as this. Now, I've just done some other digging around at stats. And The mm-hmm. Irishman on IMDb has 381,000 ratings and it has 576,000 people who have watched it on Letterboxd. Bird Box has 335,000 ratings on IMDb and on Letterbox, 677,000 watched. A Fall from Grace has 16,000 ratings on IMDb and 16,000 people have watched it on Letterbox. That 26 million does not add up. Like, I feel like they're counting people that might have scrolled across it and it started playing for like a second. I I, think that is just a rubbish number. I'm sorry, but it doesn't add up at all. I love the evidence you provide and it makes complete sense. I, I want to have an optimistic view about this and like believe that Netflix wouldn't lie with numbers. Like <laughs> I, I know, I know it doesn't make sense, but like if you, me just, as you roll those stats up, you think about it and you think about the targets and the demographics of this film. And you think back to this stage where Netflix were criticized, I guess a bit where, you know, they, they put their different film posters out for different target audiences and things like that. Mm-hmm. My guess is that, if you're an African American at this stage when this came out, this was all like this. There probably would have been five different posters for this film, whatever you scrolled through on Netflix. And I completely agree. I reckon that probably people may have chucked on for a minute, and they counted mm-hmm. that as a as a as a watch. Um, but if you think about when a theatrical um, Tyler Perry film comes out, the numbers sort of align a little bit. If if everyone that was going to go, if this came out theatrically, and everyone that was going to see it th- theatrically jumped on netflix to check it out maybe maybe it could be true but yeah i, I i'm just trying to play just the that, other side <laughs> when i i just see that sixteen thousand people have watched online i know not, not letterbox is not everyone but for context that that is like one one fiftieth of what bird box was and they're saying it got the same numbers in the first week i just i just can't see how that happened if 26 million people saw it in the first week alone there'd be more people talking about it. that that's all i'm saying and but this this isn't a letterbox this isn't a letterbox type film and uh, I mean like I'll put it in the show notes there there is so much um, online from the black community about this film online um, and I'll put a link there's a really good like uh, article that's got great commentary all done through Black Voice um, which I'll put the link in the show notes which is worth checking out so I th- oh, yeah it's it's an interesting thing thing but yeah I think. You know, you're probably right. I'm not disagreeing with you, but there's. Gonna, there's I, gonna I be get that there'd be a lot of people that wouldn't have done it, but the gulf is just too big. Like that gap yeah. is enormous. <laughs> well, so I, I, I get what you're saying. Irishman played in theaters, but prior as well. So people that probably really wanted to see that may have done that. The daunting runtime of that film, Bird Box, sort of became a sleeper hit based on the memes and stuff. I don't know. I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? Just trying to. When you got six hundred and seventy-seven thousand <laughs> versus sixteen thousand, like it doesn't add up to me. <laughs> Yeah, fair, fair, fair. Uh, what else you got? Oh, what else you got? Uh, this was nominated for two, two awards, won both these awards. So the BMI Film and TV Awards, it won the Streaming Film Award and it won the Invisible Woman Award at the Women Film Critics Circle Awards for um, Cicely Tyson, the, the older lady um, at the end of the film. The 
I mean, and there's lots of commentary on social media about this film, and a lot of criticism around the film. Uh, you know, about the the camera work, the the mics, the boom mics dropping in on scenes, continuity errors. Um, you know, extras sitting there just staring at the camera, which is, and if you go back and look at some of these scenes, it's it's quite funny. Um, that obviously five days, you, you don't have time to go do reshoots, and 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 there's commentary saying that you know, sometime after the film's released, that they went back and edited this a little bit more um, and then they've fixed a few, a few of the oh. scenes and a few of the, the glaring emissions. Um, and there's been no real announcement about this though, but at some stage Netflix or Tyler Perry has gone back in and, and reformatted a few of the scenes and, and fixed a few things up. Uh, <laughs> the other thing that there's this line in this film um, where ashtray bitch, and this was like a, an internet meme, uh, which was quite funny at the time. <laughs> uh, Tyler Perry claimed that the line wasn't actually in the script, and something that he added on the spot. So it's something that he's reminded his father saying, so he just added it in. So it's a cool little thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you see the tagline for this one? No, you know, I try and avoid it. Good. So the tagline for this one is, every woman has a breaking point. Um, yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Because, yeah, the, the females in this film, both do, or the main two, have, have breaking points. Yep. Translations around That's the world. I'll finish, finish off with this. Uh, Brazil, this was called The Edge of Betrayal. In okay. Czech, it's called The Ruin of Mrs. Grace. In French, huh. it's called The Fatal Break. In Greek, The Fate oh. of Grace. In Hungary, it's called Disgraced. <laughs> oh, boy. In Italy, it's called Grace's Truth. In Poland, Grace's Fall. Russia, it's just called Fall. Uh, in Spanish, it's just called treacherous. Sorry, <laughs> I struggle with this word at the best of times. Treacherously, 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 and, treacherously. And in Vietnam, it's called broken faith. So uh, a mixed bag of uh, titles for this film across the world. I think we got the best one. I think a fall from grace, obviously the the play on words, the grace yeah. factor. It's a bit ambiguous, doesn't give anything away. I think we we scored well there. I think so too. Um, Let's look at what the critics and people are saying about this film. What have you got? Yeah, so I've got a 5.8 out of 10 on IMDb. As I said, 16,000 people uh, have rated it there. Letterboxd, a little bit lower, 2.6 out of 5, uh, 11,500 ratings on Letterboxd. Rotten Tomato is pretty negative. Uh, sits on a 15% on 27 reviews from critics. So that is uh, very rotten. And the audience has it on 50%, which is on a bit more than 250 ratings. So not well received by critics, this film at all. Mm. And that leads us into your critical mind. What are your early thoughts on this one? Yeah, I've been a bit reserved so far and I've been enjoying hearing the context that you've given about Tyler Perry and about the situation about making this film. My little summary of it would say this was kind of like Days of Our Lives, trying to do an episode of CSI, but having a two-hour runtime to do it. Um, but in all honesty, this movie was shocking. Um, it was it was so poorly thought out. It was so poorly put together. Um, I'll get obviously further into the issues when we when we chat more about it. But it's one of those examples where Netflix, I think, rightfully gets scorned for their choices because on one hand we applaud them for giving filmmakers this full creative license to just go out there and make a movie, and on the other hand, this one had so many red flags in it that you feel like there'd be a point where a studio exec would put their hand up and be like all right, this isn't working. We need to fix it. But you've got to take the good with the bad because we, we applaud Netflix, on the other hand, for doing that with, with a lot of filmmakers too. So um, it's fair enough with all the context about this movie, but it was a shocking movie. <laughs> fair. Uh, I, mean, I think having the expectations of, of what a Tyler Perry movie is meant to be, I, I went in with the right mind frame or the mindset for this. I, I was into the wackiness, the ridiculousness, the plot points. Um, even if it is a pretty um, ordinarily made film, uh, I, I still had I still have an okay time. <laughs> uh, good, uh, that's good. No, I, I, it's better if that you do. So this will yeah. make the conversation a lot better. <laughs> All right, characters. Hit us up with some characters. So I think I'm probably going to talk more about characters in terms of why the character may not have worked, as opposed to trying to dissect the character. But I will start with Grace, um, and and. Put simply, Grace did seem like a, a sweet lady who kind of had such horrible self-esteem that she almost invites these bad things into her life. She's got this constant self-doubt about everything she does, like 
she doesn't deserve happiness. And when she finds some happiness, she's kind of pinching herself that it shouldn't be true. So as a result, you've got this person who just doesn't want to fight this case. You know, she pleads guilty because, I mean, I guess she thought she killed him. Um, oh, we should have done a spo- Spoil- yeah, spoiler yeah. alert. <laughs> Uh, let's step that. I mean, we know we know at the start, right? We know at the start, right, that she's on trial for murder from the very start. So if you do want to watch this, we're going to spoil it even more than that. Um, so come back and listen to us after you've watched it. But we haven't. That's I spoiled like the first minute, so that's fine. Um, now I'm going to spoil it some more because then you've got Sarah, obviously, who who lies about Grace's son's involvement. You know, on the night that he was hit with a baseball bat, because she doesn't want her son to get involved. So I. I I kind of get why she didn't want to push that any further, but I kind of need to know why and how she was arrested because if there was nobody, you would assume that there's at least some days before she was arrested. It wouldn't have been immediately on the spot when she got home. Um, so in that time, you would have 100% spoken to your son. I know you don't want to corroborate him, but you would have been like, hey, you know, Sarah told me you're at the house. What you do with the body kind of thing? And um, he was like, no, I wasn't at your house and there was no body. And that, that's sort of part of the, the story. And I guess in, in, in that sense, the character just didn't add up to me. Like you're on trial for murder. You would have you would have just ticked a few things off before you get to that position where you're just like, yeah, whatever, I'm guilty. I'll go to jail for the rest of my life. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a thing that's just in there for the plot to progress it, to give you ulterior motives as to this crime and how it could have happened and you know why she's protecting her son and yeah it doesn't yeah. necessarily make sense but yeah I'm, the the whole film doesn't necessarily make sense the whole way so um i'm gonna forgive it for that but yeah i, I agree with grace um I, I think the the whole idea of her being this most wholesome person in the world you know going to church feeding the homeless um baking cookies like <laughs> They overdid this quite a bit, and like it was like <laughs> we, we just we just got to keep pumping it up to you that she's such a good person. So she's great. Couldn't it, could, it couldn't be her? Couldn't be her. The the biggest twist would have been if it actually was her. Um, That's true. I, I, the whole idea, and I think this this part was done well with her as a character was that that idea of a, a divorcee who's been let down by men, having to do it by herself, rebuild her life, um, and it leads into a lot of like a lot of what I took out of it through the themes, I guess, which we'll talk about at the end. Um, but the the whole like, like the, I guess I don't know when we're going to talk about Shannon, this guy that sort of comes into her life and, and turns it around for her, for her. That middle section of her voiceover, uh, literally going through those those emotions of you know feeling loved and feeling no longer lonely in the world anymore. That like, like you mentioned in your thing, like that daytime soap opera style sort of thing. I just thought that was so <laughs> uh, it was so so different to what you're expecting in a what's titled as a thriller film and you, you're trying to work out this case and then it just turns into this whole middle section of a you know a, a love story but it, it was quite a, an interesting switch up but i think that happened because and I'm, this was in scenes i didn't like was that i felt like she was trying to tell the story of how she felt because on screen you, you didn't really get that like you didn't really see this connection between these two characters so they're chucking a voice over to be like oh shit like just in case this, this was great time for me. I was really happy. <laughs> That's what it felt like to me. Oh god! All right. Um, who else have we got? So Jasmine, and and this is where it stands out for me that this movie actually doesn't have a hero, and that's okay. But it doesn't have a hero like at all because Jasmine, who I guess is the proxy hero, spends the majority of this story about as useless as a tits on bull because she kind of buggers up everything she does in one way or another. All of her decisions seem to be motivated by her own self, which is bizarre for someone who's a defense lawyer um, because she's happy to take the plea deal because she realizes she doesn't really want to be a lawyer anyway at some point in this movie. Uh, and then she pushes Grace to change her plea because she has a, has a hunch that there's more to the case, despite not actually finding any evidence that suggests that's true. But that's okay. We're just going to risk everything, this lady. Then she buggers up in court has her client sentenced to murder and then she ends up in jail herself because she's acting like a moron and she completely stumbles on the discovery of, of what happens because uh, she just decided to go to Sarah's house to see how she was doing and somehow comes out of all this as the hero. Like she didn't, she was even in the room. The old lady was telling her everything that's going on. She's like, Hey, it's all right. We'll, we'll call you. We'll look after you. Like, like this, the signs are all there. Like, I don't know. This was—I just didn't like this character at all, and I don't know why. At the end, they're like, they had that news story about, oh, and you know, Jasmine, who's you know, the leader of this case, doing this. I'm like, no, she sucked. 
I, yeah, I, I feel like it's the same a bit with, what, like I mentioned with Grace, how they've overdone the niceness of the character. They overdid the inexperience and freshness and complete um, inability to control any situation with her, like in every single scene. And like, you know, when she goes to meet Grace first and she drops the folder on the floor, that's just like the perfect example of, <laughs> you know, we're just going to keep pushing it in your face about how she's, she's useless at what she does. <laughs> and, you know, uh, I think, and they pump it, you know, I'm only, you know, the only cases you do are like misdemeanors and plea cases. That's why you're giving you this one. Yes, this is the biggest case in the world, in the world of the still <laughs> at the moment, but we're giving it to yeah. you because it's a plea case. That, that's all it is sort of thing. Uh, and I, I, it was interesting. I, I never quite got the her partner, Jordan, like, were they married? Were they just together? Um, the co-workers, they were so, like, supportive of her. And then her boss is mm. obviously, Rory, he's not supportive of her. It was like she didn't really have anyone in her world that was 100% there by her side the whole time. Um, it was just, yeah, it was a, an interesting character. But again, like, th- this isn't the type of film that you're like, cool, I'm there to connect with a, a character. It's a good point, though. Yeah, there was a bit wishy-washy with her relationship with other characters. She was all over the place, though. Yeah. Um, let's go into Sarah. I, for me, it was just so obvious from the minute that we met her that she was up to something and there was more there. And it kind of bothers me that everyone else seems so oblivious to this when they make sure the audience knows. Like, I, I, it was obviously deliberate that they wanted us to think there was something up with Sarah. But none of the characters had any idea. And I just think that was really amateur filmmaking. So... Obviously, Jasmine, as I said, decides to randomly go check on her to see how she is. Oh, by the way, you know, drop me off here on the street so there's no car, so no one knows that I'm here just in case you can say my car's at the front. We know we're getting that big reveal. That, that was the thing. We, like, they're, they're setting us up so much for this big reveal that it, even though you might not know specifically what's happening, obviously I wasn't expecting like 40 women <laughs> chained up in the basement, <laughs> but but you knew the reveal was coming, like so that they like spoon feed that to you so much. And I, uh, the reveal, I think, is the key for this whole movie. I think they thought of a reveal, then wrote a movie around it. Um, but then they, they just like didn't reveal it properly. It, it felt felt very forced. And Sarah just felt so obvious in that in that role. Good. I, um, I'm not as smart as you, obviously, because I... I, I didn't know how it was going to get there. I wasn't that clicked on um, as to like, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I was sort of bought the whole idea for the first half that Sarah was a good friend. Um, and I, I, I didn't have an inkling that she was massively, like I know that she set her up with this guy pretty much to go to the gallery and, and all that sort of stuff, but I didn't necessarily think that they were in on it together. Uh, so I was sort of, a, I got a little bit of a surprise in that, which was good, but at the same time, um, <laughs> Good. You know, it, it led to that part of that. Who's who's the narrator of the story, and and that that, and I don't think that there was any intention of giving different clues off through different narrations, whether it was Grace or whether it was Sarah, whose whose story we were being told or whose point of view we were being told it through. Um, and that probably is something that that could have could have been a bit more clever if you give a a narration through Sarah that becomes less believable or, or sorry, more believable. Um, sure. And that that could have worked a bit, but yeah, I agree. It was at the very start when she first went and met with her and this only person that she met with, I'm like, well, there's something here. Yeah, and yeah. she was kind of like, shoot her out of the house really quickly. And like, it was just, there was just something there. You'd, as I said, I didn't know the details of it, but I knew that Sarah was something. But surely you knew, I think they might've already given you some clues when Jasmine was like, hey, just, I'm just going to go see how Sarah is. Just, I'm just going to, on a whim, I'm just going to see how she is. You knew that that was leading to something, right? right. You, of course, you yeah, knew yeah. that something was going on. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that, but that, that could have been so much better. Better. Shannon, you gonna we gonna talk about Shannon? <laughs> yeah, like in this in this story specifically, I mean, I, I think he he rang an alarm bell from the start. But I'll, I'll give it some credit for the fact that in real life, these types of predators do exist, and they do have the ability to con lonely people. So as much as it might seem ridiculous, the way he was acting and the way that he sucked her in, I think the point of the story is to, you know watch out for these kind of people because let's not pretend that um, they don't exist. But also, as an audience member, you kind of do realise something was completely off with this guy from the very start and didn't quite add up. But, um, yeah, he was uh, he was a bit much. <laughs> sure, like just the complete, you know, so over the top and then the complete con artist scumbag. Um, you know, the, the two traits that he said, or the two things he doesn't like was like being checked up on and having been questioned, like... What sort of a person are you when you're when you, like, they're your two things that you don't like in life? Um, yeah. 
But like one, <laughs> the one thing I wrote, one thing I wrote down about this guy I was like, this guy's buff and he'd ready to back it down in the post. Like he would be a good power forward. Just <laughs> that guy was whew. big man. <laughs> oh man, huge. Uh, any other characters? Not for me. No. Good. All right. Well, we spoke already a little bit about Tyler Perry. Um, just like this guy's a beast. The, the amount of work he does, the amount of directing credits, writing, does a bit of acting too. You would know him from Gone Girl and, yep. and films like that. So, um, yeah, I like the guy. <laughs> yeah, uh, he's doing good. He's doing really good stuff. And then what you spoke about at the start is um, incredibly. He feels like an incredibly important uh, person in the industry. All right, this is going to be the fun part where we talk about scenes. I'm very excited to 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 do this part. So, is there anything in this that you enjoyed to start off with? So th- this was like the one time I finished watching the movie and there wasn't a scene, but I, I gave it some thought and I I kind of liked the speech that Tyler Perry gave in the courtroom about leaving a witness. You, you know, you just left a witness who said your client was a murderer. I kind of liked it just because it made sense and finally someone was speaking sense. What I thought was weird that her husband was still in the room just leaning on the wall <laughs> during that scene. I was like, has anyone no, he told did, him he's still he there? didn't I know. stand up for her. didn't stand up for her. I know. That, and then it came with the next scene. But when I'm watching that scene, I'm like, why is he there? And I'm like, he'll say something. And then the scene ended and he didn't say anything. I'm like, did they just forget to like take him out of the room? And then obviously it came in the next scene. But, you know, I appreciated someone being like, hey, you can't just you can't just leave leave." Caught like that, she just said he's about yeah. So that was good. <laughs> um, all right. So I have got a few things that like that are probably just like funny moments for me that probably weren't meant to be funny, but I'm, I'm still going to put them in as things I like. So I while while it did, we mentioned this. I mentioned this before, but while it went on for way too long, I think I could see how Grace was swept up by Shannon. Um, like that line about um, why me and why not you? I, that whole thing or that idea of that I felt I did feel her aliveness I felt how especially when I've got the shots of her of where she is sitting in the prison cell and, and how disheveled she looks to see this aliveness in her I, I did like that comparison because I, I could feel why she was into this so I thought that was done okay if, if you were falling in love with someone Jesse and, and you know you had that self-doubt and we're like why me and that would kind of like just like why not? Yeah, I'd want some more justification. <laughs> I know, why I you? I yeah, you're as good yeah, as anyone. Why not? Tell me why. Why not? <laughs> um, Tell me why. What are the things you like about me? Tell me. <laughs> the Fair lying in I, 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 the lying in bed. There, I had to put this in there. I want an ashtray. <laughs> Just oh my god, it was hilarious. It was hilarious. I want an ashtray. That was good. Um, the the whole you mentioned this before the the shot of all the old ladies tied up in that room just shot, shot. I was like whoa hang on what's going on here <laughs> was just like, expecting that, like, <laughs> that got me um and then that fight scene between Sarah and Jordan in the kitchen was just hilarious like I just I, I killed myself laughing just the saucepan and then she throws the paper bag of groceries at him <laughs> ah yeah <laughs> I like that I thought it was funny and I know it wasn't meant to be funny but I thought it was good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Time to unload. What didn't you like? Well, hopefully I can paint a picture here as opposed to just teeing off, but paint a picture of why this movie didn't work. So initially, I've got Grace and Shannon at the cafeteria or wherever they had that that date. I just There was just no chemistry, and I felt like they weren't even getting on with each other. And I just I didn't know why they liked each other. And, and during that conversation, she just kept referencing her divorce which I don't think was like a deliberate thing. I just think it's like they were running out of things to say. I don't know. The whole the whole scene didn't work. I mentioned before that I didn't like the use of narration to tell the story as just like a as just like a catch all in case you didn't know what was going on. Yeah. Yep. Um, it really bothered me when Grace got fired and was never allowed any sort of explanation about what happened or like, hey, you Go. just stole this money. It's like, have a hang on. No, 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 you're out. I don't want to hear why. I don't like that was ridiculous. Come on, like give us some credit. Okay. So this is where I thought the movie was going to get good. So you found out that the body was missing. And if I'm not mistaken, we didn't know that initially, right? So they said like, oh, by the way, the body's missing. I was like, oh, that's interesting. It was 70 minutes into the film, which is is a bit long but so then i started asking myself the attorney who's asking grace about this didn't know that the body was missing that's that's insane to me like hey you're on this murder trial by the way there's no body so this this whole movie is about finding a case 
that is beyond reasonable doubt that she didn't kill somebody. So it's not even saying you need to prove it completely. You just need non reasonable doubt. And there is no body. What the hell? That is incredible amount of doubt that she didn't kill this guy where there's no body. And that is the whole point of this <laughs> film. And they never found <laughs> well, you know, The headphones have just come off because the end is so agitated with this film. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was the whole point of the movie. I just, <laughs> just the more I thought about that, the more I was so furious. I'm like, this doesn't work. Who thought about this? Who pulled up the person who thought about this? I had big issues with that. I mean, yeah. <laughs> like, I could just keep talking about it. But the attorney didn't know there was nobody. You are working. <laughs> just come on. So that bothered me. That bothered me. <laughs> <laughs> and I've only got one more scene to mention that kind of closes this whole thing out. I mentioned we never get that hero moment because she stumbled on all by accident. But they're in the courtroom at the end. And obviously, Grace gets off at the end because they find out that Sarah was doing it all. And Tyler Perry, who's been rightfully critical of Jasmine, or sorry, Rory, rightfully <laughs> critical of Jasmine throughout this whole film, just gives her the big thumbs up. Like, well done, Jasmine. It's like, no, she didn't do it. She didn't do anything. Oh, it was so nice. I had I had that as well. Oh. That was just like a horrendous way to, to, to oh. like a cheesy smile and stuff. Sorry, so, Jasmine. Good. You're still fired because you're awful at your job. <laughs> All right. Uh, is, there, uh, is there anything you didn't write like? Yes, there are. There definitely are. Um the whole like so Jordan uh, Jasmine's partner like he's like finally ready to debrief about seeing the old woman fall to her death uh, like from the opening scene and um, and Jasmine goes into that thing about I don't want to be a lawyer anymore the score the sound this this the music changed to about three different thematic levels in that one conversation like it was like up uplifting and down and low it was just so funny i was just like <laughs> that, that brings in that that soap opera style that you were talking about um rory um uh, so jasmine's boss rory says uh you like you I didn't like this but you mentioned this before that whole like, that speech that he does you know saying you let a witness say your client is a murderer and then he finished off with this must be a millennial thing that i'll never understand I thought that was the worst line of dialogue I've heard in a film, like for about ten years. But, but it must be—it's just a millennial thing. I just don't understand it. How? Why? I don't. That, that, that's <laughs> it's, horrendous. It's even worse. It's just even like a bigger whack. It's just like you are such an idiot. So young. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't understand where that's come from. You are so stupid. Um, but she got the thumbs up at the end. Thumbs up, and then after like this, you know, horrible day in the courtroom, uh, Jasmine and Jordan go home and they have dinner, and just like. Full loses that him like cracks that him. You didn't stand up for me. You're on, not on my side. It was just it was it was. <laughs> and and then he was like, "Yeah, but I thought Rory made some good points." <laughs> <laughs> it was so bad. Um, and then the uh, the whole court scene, like just the whole like you you mentioned this in in what you said, but the, the whole idea of the legal process. People have got a good enough an idea to know how that works, but. The whole thing of her just constantly being like, no, nah, I'm calling Sarah back to the stand. <laughs> it's like, the case is done. <laughs> this is the, this is the end. And like, obviously, as an audience, you're like, oh, you know, she's trying to get a mistrial. She's try- you're not going to get a mistrial from for, for this. This was your fault for it's not like, calling her it's back. It's done. The <laughs> <laughs> and then when she's in bars and then Rory visits her and she like tells him to F off. I was like, oh, yeah, well done. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> told you, you're the one behind bars. <laughs> and um, the last thing, the... The final scene, like, we do not need as an audience the idea that there could be a sequel to this. I know they probably <laughs> want to leave it up, but, but you got Sarah going back to a new old person's house ready to do a con again. Please. No, Please, no, we didn't that need too. that. Did not need that. I was I was done by then. No. I was like, this, this is <laughs> getting a sequel, so I can just ignore this scene. <laughs> All right, let's let's go. Some themes, some ideas. What do you, what are you thinking about this one? Well, you know what? I'd rather, I'd rather you, you. Can you talk to the themes first? My, yeah. Mine aren't that exciting, and I know that you took a bit more out of this film, so it's going to be more beneficial for for you to get the ball rolling with this. I reckon. All right, I'll I'll start with a quote from Tyler Perry. So he said, "I just want people to know that no matter how dark, no matter how bad, no matter how dismal the scene or situation you're in, there's still hope." That was his underlying idea for this film. So a little bit of that idea of faith. And we see that a little bit through the religious, but that idea of trust and 
loneliness and vulnerability, which leads to what I took out of this mainly is that the economic dangers for for elderly or, or isolated or lonely people. Yeah. Um, you know, the idea of Ponzi schemes, Ponzo schemes, uh, being taken advantage of by family. And then also, obviously, Tyler Perry, that idea of unfairness of the the legal system on on Black Americans. Um, this this woman was literally, you know, here's a plea deal. You obviously did it. Let's let's not even hear your story properly, um, which which was a bit sad, really. And then I guess there's a little bit too about mother and son bonds too. Like I know that like Grace is trying to protect her own son, and then on the other hand, on the other side of things too, you've got Sarah and Shannon who obviously um, mm-hmm. have a have a pretty good relationship even though it's not a, a good way that they should go about it they've got a good relationship as a mother and daughter working off uh, mother and son working off each other so yeah <laughs> that's me trying you to be- say yeah you can argue they've got a successful working relationship back there <laughs> that's me trying to be question serious, there <laughs> yeah. but, uh, look uh, and the the things to take out of this film are definitely definitely serious and i, I do like the explicit thing of you know ca- careful of the people who, who do prey on others and prey on the weak and the elderly and the lonely, you know, because they do exist. And if watching this film is something that triggers that for people, then that's, that's a good thing, I think. Um, and the, all else I really took out of it was that ability to get, get your life out of first gear a little bit, which I think Jasmine was kind of just stuck in and, you know, the what she kind of achieved when she had a bit of motivation behind her was more than she was actually doing and, uh, and then that ability to fight with your gut, which you know, again comes across questionably, you know, the idea about all the evidence suggesting that you're wrong, but because your gut says you're right and go for it, it you know, it, it, it kind of, kind of is there as well. Good, yeah, excellent. Well, did you take anything away from this film other than not liking it? <laughs> no, I did. Like, I, I learned why. Like, I think the reason I didn't like it was because the film was way too concerned about this big shocking reveal that it didn't really bother Warren that the other parts of the story didn't quite add up. You know, it didn't, they didn't, they didn't work or they just sort of came across as this amateur opportunity to serve this reveal. And when there's holes all across the story, that it's like, don't worry, don't worry. We're going to get to this reveal. That's, that's, you know, we'll forget about that. And I get that this is took five days to, to film, but, there's got to be a level of this; these holes appearing in the screenplay as well. So they, they could have tidied that up from the start too. Yeah. The only thing, I've, I've, it's more a statement, I've, and we said this at the start, I really like the title of this film. I think it's, yep. they, they probably spent more than five days uh, coming up with that title. So it's, <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, now, this that's is one of those favorite. titles that someone would have thought of and said it, and everyone's like, that's amazing. We're not going to make a better title. It would have just, It would have just clicked. Good. Uh, did you go on IMDb to look anyone up? I did. I'm glad you spoke about how Shannon, played by McCard Brooks, was just this massive man. <laughs> I don't know how much True Blood you watched, but he was uh, he was in True Blood. He played Eggs, who was like dated Tara for a while. And you know what got for me was was his voice. His voice. I'm like that voice is really because he's got that really specific deep voice. And I noticed that and I looked at him like, oh, of course. Like, this is a guy I haven't seen anywhere since, like, 2008. And it still just clicked on me. And I remember him just being this big dude in True Blood as well. He's only in probably a season, maybe two. But um, there you go. He's back. Cool. Good pick. Uh, I didn't look anyone up in particular, but there was mention of uh, the when Sarah's talking uh, to Grace about dating. And she's like, you know, why don't you check out uh, ChristianDateOnline.com? So I was like, cool. Oh, yeah. Let's see if that's a real website. Uh, it's not. But there is a website it's called Christian, christiandate.com. There's just no christiandateonline.com. So they know the website okay. exists, but probably didn't have the, the rights for it. So I thought that was pretty funny. Yeah. Is it that's, just a man called Christian who wants dates? <laughs> no, it's, the, the, it's no, a pretty... It christian.com. Christian.com. It looked like a 1990s uh, version of a dating site. <laughs> so it's pretty, <laughs> pretty, pretty funny. Have you got any questions that you'd like to ask? I actually don't, Jesse. I, right. I just okay. had too much fun. This has been therapeutic for me, so I didn't actually have any questions because I just Good. didn't I, think that that closely. Or maybe I did. I don't know. Go on. I what have you got? I got a couple. I won't take too much time. Oh. I promise, but I do have a few. <laughs> um, <laughs> what were Sarah and her son actually doing with the money? They've they've schemed all these people over the years. All these. People. What are they doing? What have they got? They, I don't know. It's a great. So you're t- talking. Grace alone was was what like around four hundred grand, and they got the house, which they took another mortgage at, which was like another, I can't remember how much it was, 
that's just one person. one person. They got all these people down yeah. there. They've, uh, they they must have millions of dollars. Yeah. Maybe they just yeah. it's the thrill. It's the thrill yeah. of the chase. Good question. Um, so my only observation, I guess, is Jordan as a police officer. And this is probably more a statement than a question, but I was gonna. He's not a very good cop. Like he handcuffs a guy, and then drives off on him. <laughs> then he does the same. <laughs> does the same with Sarah, and then she runs away. But I guess the the big question is how did Sarah get out of that house handcuffed and get the handcuffs off? I mean, <laughs> getting out of the house is fine. With your, you, like just walk out. <laughs> yeah, 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 but you, you, your legs are still working. And then you gotta find you gotta find something that can that can get the handcuffs out. But that's a really good point. Did they show that scene of him handcuffing the guy and driving off just to be like, by the way, this is just a thing that he does. He this, does. Is, this is his thing. It's, a trait. it's gonna come back later on. Because um, I would have just like handcuffed her to the table or even like a chair, which you know she still could have walked out with, but it would have been more cumbersome. It was very dumb. Yeah. Uh the other one, or maybe I missed something on this, but so Grace, we we see that she does a little bit of research. On judgment, and she says, um, the name Danielle Mitchell, she died here, she was your client. Did I miss something, or, or did uh, someone who was just in for a misdemeanor die in an interview room with, while Jasmine was signing the plea deal? That's a very, very good point. Obviously, that was just I, I'm assuming she figured that out via just talk of the, the prison. prison. Someone's yeah. like, Oh, you got you got Jasmine because that bloody, but yeah, she only got like crappy little misdemeanor cases. <laughs> Yeah, but maybe she had another one like Grace that was just like a murder case that was a plea she deal, died. and then she's like, "Yeah, well, maybe she killed herself because she just didn't want to go to jail for life." Maybe. Um, and we sort of touched on this: the, the the twists in the eye, like the whole Shannon being a con man was really obvious and dragged on. But the one scene that the old ladies in that house—did you see that coming? <laughs> no, the old, old and it, it, not not at all. And I think it was really good. My question is, how come that old lady who they found is always just wandering around? around? Why isn't she tied up downstairs? Yeah. I trust her, I guess. I don't know. Because um, Shannon was home, clearly. Yeah. Like, Because when Jazza went down there, he got her. But they yeah. just like, ah, let old Betty or whatever her name yeah. is. She can wander, wander around. around. And... <laughs> well, she was wandering around in the start, remember, when she was first. She exactly, that's what I mean. Yeah. 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 All right, let's, uh, let's wrap this up. What are, you, what are your final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I can't stress how much fun I've had talking about this. Um, <laughs> it's just a really poorly put together movie that it wasn't properly thought out either, but it was in a way that I almost found a little bit offensive. Like, you get those movies that treat their audiences in, as intellectuals and they assume they'll just pick up on things. I think this was the opposite. I thought there were so many amateur rush decisions that they're just like, ah, don't worry, the audience is too dumb. They're not going to know this anyway. They'll they'll miss this. Oh, they won't figure this out. It's like, no, we, we figured it all out, and you guys are idiots faking it. So I just thought this was a stinking film. Um, and I'll give it one and a half stars. Nice. Um, yeah, I, I, it's poorly made, but I still had a lot of fun. <laughs> it was all over the shop. The crazy ending sort of had me laughing. And like, the Tyler Perry film, you, you sort of know that they have plot holes. They have... Just random stuff throughout. So uh, I still, I'm getting, I'm giving it two and a half. <laughs> I still, I didn't hate it. So two and a half for me. So, uh, that's fair enough. <laughs> gives us a two where I probably should sit. So, um. <laughs> I can't stress enough though, Jesse. Like a plot hole for me where the entire movie is based is on this hole. case <laughs> it doesn't add up. That's that's as big a plot plot hole as I can recall. Like it's someone's got to say, hey. Tyler, where, what's going on here? Ah, it's fine, mate. We'll be ah, no one's gonna notice. That's that's what it felt like. Five days filming the whole thing. You you're probably not even noticing. Just, you're like, we just gotta get it done now. Yeah. <laughs> credit to him. I get I I will applaud that. Like, yeah, I want people making more movies, so that's fine. But um uh, make them better. Good. We're on social, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Can a movie be bad but still be truly good? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that's how you say it properly, but I'm just wondering. I think that's fair. I think they yeah. definitely can be. There's movies that you think are terrible and you're just like, I just had the best time watching best time. them. Yeah, I think so too. Um, all right, we're, we're back next week. We've got a, another 2020 film. It's a Brazilian comedy called oh, Airplane Mode or Modo Avia. It's directed by Cesar Rodriguez and it stars Larissa Manella, Erasma Carlos, Kanuska Kanora, Andre Frambach and Danny Ornelas. That's what we've got next week, a Brazilian film. All righty. Been a while. Have we had a Brazilian film? Uh, 
yes, it was like a Western slash, uh, what was it uh, called? Oh, uh, yeah, um, The Killer. The Killer, The Killer. There you go, yeah. Yeah, yes. Oh, Matador. Oh, Matador. Very good. Very good, good memory. So uh, we'll see. We'll see what this one's like. Um, oh, as always, that was it's, it's, interesting, that film. Yeah, this, this was good chat, good fun. I'm glad we uh, we well, both got on board for this one. <laughs> Uh, I would have been so annoyed if I couldn't talk to someone about this film. So this has been <laughs> wonderfully, as I said, wonderfully therapeutic for me. So thank you very much. Good. Uh, I will uh, see you next week. You will. <laughs> <laughs>